Good morning and welcome to the second day of Congress. My name is Gail Cartmail, Assistant General Secretary at UNITE and this year's TUC President. Thanks to all our delegates and audience members joining us from their homes or their workplaces. Today we're going to continue with our discussions on the big issues that matter to working people and their families, including debates on the recovery from COVID-19 pandemic. I'm delighted to be uh, joined on the platform today by my good friend Mary Bowstead, um, our general, um, of our General Counsel, alongside the General Secretary Francis O'Grady and TUC's Deputy General Secretary Paul Novak. Um, Francis will be addressing us later in the session. As we did yesterday, we'll take a series of uh, delegates in all our debates. If you're speaking and you haven't received a Zoom link, please contact your union delegation leader or Kevin Rowan in the GPC office as soon as possible. To all speakers joining the debates this morning, now this is important, so listen, um, please could you make sure that your own name is displayed on your Zoom account so we're able to find you and bring you on screen. Once on Zoom, you'll be asked whether you give permission for the host to unmute you. Please um, select yes. Um, that would be really helpful. Before we start on our first debate of the day, may I remind General Secretaries or their delegates that the ballot for Section C and D of the General Council and the General Purposes Committee closed today at 12 noon. That's 12 noon today. Please note that the NASUWT have withdrawn their nomination from Section H of the General Council. Therefore, this section is now uncontested and Dave Allen is elected. Those el eligible to vote have been sent an email from Civica Election Services with a unique link to the secure voting site. Delegation leaders have been told who to contact in case of a problem with the voting link or any issues with voting. So Congress, we now begin our first debate of the day. We continue with section four of the General Counsel report on good services. As we did yesterday, those moving a motion will have five minutes to speak and everyone else will have three minutes. As always, timings are a ceiling, not a recommendation, and you really, really, really don't have to use it all. Um, I'll leave that with you. I would like to remind everyone about our code of conduct. It goes without saying that we expect all attendees to behave in a respectful, kind, and considerate manner. And again, as I said yesterday, if there are any glitches, blame me. Thank you. I call paragraph 2.10, and Composite Motion 13, Public Sector Pay and Pensions. The General Counsel support the Composite Motion. The Composite Motion will be moved by Mark Sawatka from PCS, then seconded by Heather Hughes from EIS. Mark, you are really very welcome. Uh, good morning, Gail. Uh, President, Congress, Mark Sawatka on behalf of PCS, uh, moving Composite 13. Uh, and in starting, Gail, on behalf of my union, can I congratulate you on the most amazing presidential address yesterday and your presiding over conference. Now, pay and pensions are the key factors in determining the living standards of public sector workers. And this motion deals with public sector workers. And let's remind ourselves, the people we're talking about here are the key public sector people who helped and delivered for this country during the pandemic. Our education staff, our NHS staff, our marvelous local government staff, and in my own union, PCS, the brave frontline workers who delivered on health and safety, delivering 3 million claims to universal credit, the furlough scheme, kept our justice system running, and our ports and airports open. So let's just look at the key facts of what the government is doing to the living standards of our key public sector workers because of their policies on pay and pensions. On pay, a decade of pay restraint has meant in my own union, people on average have lost 15% in real terms. Now we have a pay freeze that has turned already poverty pay now into a crisis. This year alone, with the current rate of inflation, PCS members combined 
with the national insurance rise, the level of inflation, and the stand to lose a staggering 5.25% in real terms of their income on already poverty pay. It's a scandal. When we look at the question of pensions, we also have to look at what the government is doing to these key workers. Our public sector pensions are not gold plated. For many of our members, after years of service, getting lower pay than they could get elsewhere in the economy, they're already fairly low. If you combine that with our state pension, which does not compare favorably with comparable economies around the world, it is a recipe for pensioner poverty. That's why we should call out the disgraceful government decision to abandon the triple lock this year, and also remind ourselves of the disgraceful way the government has treated women in increasing the state pension age. And let's also remember at the beginning of the last decade, the attacks on our public sector pensions meant that for all of our members, they ended up paying more, working longer and getting less. On top of that fraud, the government imposed a cost cap mechanism, which was supposed to protect the employers and employees if there was a rise in pensions costs. We now know as a result of all of our pension schemes, dramatically spending less than was forecast, we are further being ripped off. In the civil service alone, Every civil servant is paying 2% a month more for their pension than the government knows they should be paid. And instead of giving us back that money as they previously promised, they've pulled off a staggering breach of faith, ensuring that those people who did not break the law are now paying the price for the government's illegality over the McLeod judgment. Further, they've also told us that in the future, they want to change the cost cap mechanism, making sure we will pay even more. So Congress, that cannot stand. We must demand fair pay increases for everybody to smash the pay freeze, a backdating of the cost cap mechanism to ensure nobody is ripped off, and key to this, a reduction in the pension age. If 68 was too late when we started campaigning, it is certainly too late now. And we know as one of the tragic consequences of the pandemic is the predictions that everybody would live longer is sadly not true for hundreds of thousands of the people we represent. So, Gail, I'm going to sum up with this. I'm sure this motion will be carried unanimously. But Congress, we all know that carrying resolutions is not enough. Carrying this motion unanimously today will not put an extra penny in our members' pay pockets. It will not deliver pair pensions. So let us turn the clock back. Exactly 10 years ago when we met at this Congress, after four unions had taken industrial action together, the ATL, UCU, NUT and PCS, it directly led to a debate at this Congress 10 years ago that delivered 29 unions and 2 million workers taking industrial action over pensions together. Congress, we have to recreate that spirit today. Yes, we have to do the lobbying. Yes, we have to do the campaigning. Yes, we have to do the publicity. But Parliament will do not live a fairness under this Tory government unless they are forced to do so. So in concluding, Gail, the message from PCS is carry this motion, yes. But in all of our unions, let's get into the workplace, build our density, build our participation, recruit new members, but crucially this. Whilst we build at workplace level, we need bold leadership to combine our activities and coordinate our campaigning under industrial action. If we stand together, we can win on pay, we can win on pensions. Congress, let's do it. I move. Thank you very much indeed, Mark, for your contribution. Um, I'm going to call the seconder, Heather Hughes from EIS. Heather, you're welcome. Good morning, Congress. Good morning, Congress. Good morning, uh, President Delegates. Heather Hughes from the EIS seconding Composite Motion 13. The public sector is the bedrock to our country. The essential nature of our jobs was clearly highlighted throughout the last 18 months as the country faced, and indeed is still facing, the worst epidemic in living memory. COVID-19 shone a light on the importance of the public sector. The government ministers talked repeatedly of properly recognising public sector workers' pivotal role in the crisis through our pay and conditions of service. This, of course, turned out to be empty rhetoric, with the majority of pay offers being based at a level well below inflation, so effectively offering us a pay cut in real terms. 
Since 2010, Scotland's teachers' salaries, as well as those of other public sector workers, have been ero eroded by close to 20%. Our current pay offer, now at six months late, is a derisory 1.22%, less than half the current RPI inflation rate. This despite teachers demonstrating greater flexibility of working. We kept the schools open for vulnerable children. We provided learning hubs for critical workers' children and adapted our learning and teaching to digital online forums. We did all this whilst we juggled our own caring responsibilities and homeschooled our own children. The public sector workers and teachers, we were at the front line when others were working from home. The damage of real-term pay cuts is compound, compounded by the enforced and damaging changes to public sector pension schemes. Changes to pension schemes imposed by the UK government have led to us paying in more. Teachers' contributions have increased by at least 50%. Ha we're having to work for longer before we can access our pension funds and the pension scheme retirement age is currently linked to that of state pension age. It's simply not feasible for teachers and indeed other public sector workers to work until they are 67. Public sector pensions must be uncoupled from the state pension through legislation and members must have the right to return to the conditions of service they signed up for when they joined their profession. Following the victory of the McLeod Sargent case, the UK government has reneged on the promise to pass on the benefits of the last pension scheme evaluation and instead used the money to pay for the remedy which the courts insisted on to address the age discrimination highlighted in the case. Public sector pensions must be restored and the values improved. Members of pension scheme must not be the ones to pay the price for the government's discriminatory policies nor attempt to balance the public debt, especially those caused by the reckless behaviour of banks. The public sector pension age must be reduced to allow our members to live a longer and healthy, healthier retirement. Where's the incentive to recruit the highest quality workers in the public sector when the workforce is undervalued, overwork and underpaid? We must... I'm sorry, Delegate, you're really overrunning. If you could bring your um, contribution to a close. Thank you. Sentence. To work together for all frontline workers, it's time for us to level up, not to race to the bottom. The EIS seconds this composite motion. Thank you very much indeed, Heather. Um, we have another speaker in this debate, Jane Peckham from the NASUWT. Jane, you're very welcome. President, Congress, Jane Peckham, NASUWT, the Teachers' Union, speaking in support of Composite 13, public sector pay and pensions. Congress, over the last decade and more, public sector workers have endured year-on-year -year attacks on their pay and pensions through the public sector pay freezes and the government's austerity policies, resulting in ever-increasing real-term cuts in pay. Yet, as we have heard from many speakers to Congress, public sector workers have remained resolutely dedicated to providing the essential services that keep this country running. For the teaching workforce, our members, the worst impact of these attacks is being felt in England. Teachers' pay has now dropped below that of teachers in Scotland and Wales, where devolved nations have to be applauded for taking some action to mitigate against the full impact of Westminster's pay austerity. But still, across the whole of the UK, teachers' pay is nowhere near its 2010 real terms level. So as schools return for the new academic year, our members do so to the reality of a pay freeze. Add to this the impact of the rise in national insurance contributions that will be applied to all workers in 2022, and they can look forward to their pay falling even further behind the salaries of colleagues in other parts of the UK. The 2021-22 teachers' pay freeze is a disgraceful and shameful way to treat a profession who have faced the most challenging 18 months of their career. 
slap in the face for public servants who have risked their own health and well-being in order to continue to educate and support our young children throughout a global pandemic. Congress, make no mistake, teachers are angry and demoralised at this decision and the contempt it displays for their hard work, dedication and the challenging reality of teaching. The NESUWT launched a snapshot survey of members following the announcement on pay. The results are concerning but should come as no surprise. Specifically related to the pay freeze, 87% stated that this will have a ne negative impact on their morale. 83% said they will have it will have a negative impact on the recruitment and retention of teachers with all with half of all respondents make saying it will be less likely they will remain in the profession. The NASUWT continues to challenge ministers over their failed experiments on teachers pay from short term incentives to encourage new teachers through to the use of performance-related pay, which is merely served to discriminate against, divide and demoralise teachers. We are in dispute in schools across the country to stop the abhorrent practice of fire and rehire, a further attack on teachers' pay and pensions. This is a time when efforts to secure teacher retention ought to be the priority for the government, not risking it. But in all of the rhetoric around education recovery, you can be sure it is not the recovery of the workforce that is at heart. We also condemn the attack on public service pensions. In 2015, uh, the government gave a 25 year guarantee around public pension reform, but before the ink is dry, they now propose to change the cost control mechanism. In considering the implications of this, we need to remember that following the conclusion in 2016, that valuations have not met target, public sector unions across the I'm very sorry, sister, um, but again, I'm afraid um, you've gone well over the three minutes. Can you please draw your comments to a conclusion? Thank you. Cloud remedy costs as a member cost. We find finally, we welcome that this composite sets out a clear campaigning platform for a lower pension age in public se sector pension schemes. The increase in pension age was always unjustifiable. A reward for a lifetime of public service for all public sector workers. Thank you very much. I'm awfully sorry to have cut Jane off, but we won't be able to call in everybody that's given notice of wishing to speak if uh, delegates speak over their time. So. Just a note to all delegation leaders, please remind your delegates, as a courtesy to others, try to keep within time. But incredibly important points we heard from Mark, Heather and Jane. Thank you, uh, all of you, um, for your uh, contributions. As there's no opposition, the composite motion is carried. Um, we now turn to section three of the General Counsel report, Respect and Voice at Work, from page 32. I call Composite Motion 8, Online Abuse, Time for Real Change. The General Counsel support the Composite Motion. The Composite Motion will be moved by Neil Cusack from the PFA, then seconded by Hannan Barber from the CSP. Neil, uh, Nick, sorry, you're very welcome. Thank you, President. Congress, Nick Cusack, Professional Footballers Association, moving the composite motion. Racist and discriminatory abuse has impacted football for many years in this country. And whereas in the past the abuse predominantly emanated from the terraces, now players face an equally vile and disgusting type of abuse via social media. We have seen in recent weeks that our international players still face racist abuse when playing away from home. And although FIFA and UEFA condemn the perpetrators, and promise strong action, this keeps recurring. The international football authorities have failed to tackle this match day abuse effectively, which is disappointing and depressing, as much stronger action and purpose is required to get on top of this once and for all. Added to this, players also suffer abuse online, which again is not being addressed or dealt with adequately by the organisations or authorities that have the power and resources to make a real change. 
The PFA is leading the fight in this area and working with other stakeholders to press the government and social media companies to take action and eradicate online hate from their platforms. There has been extensive dialogue and engagement with the social media companies, but it is proving very difficult to get them to act in a decisive way. That is frustrating, as in other areas such as infringement of copyright, it seems that action can be taken much more swiftly and effectively. If you contrast this approach with the response to online discriminatory abuse, a reasonable conclusion to be drawn is that this does not appear to be as much of a priority for them. Indeed, the legal framework as it stands also allows them to drag their feet as social media companies benefit from an exemption from liability for content on their platforms. In such a void, it is left to local law enforcement to deal with the policing of online hate. Not surprisingly, given the lack of resources here, monitoring and investigation is limited, often leaving perpetrators to act with impunity and confident that their actions will almost certainly go unpunished. It is not as if the PFA and other football stakeholders are making unreasonable or unworkable demands on the social media companies. We believe that we have asked for is well within their ability to deliver on and includes measures such as filtering and blocking of racist and discriminatory content, prompt removal of this content, a more robust verification process, and more assistance to law enforcement agencies in bringing abusers to justice. The response has not been satisfactory from our perspective and little progress has been made, but that has not deterred us. Within football, we have been proactive in monitoring social media platforms, reporting abuse and working with the police and the CPS so that perpetrators of online hate face real life consequences for their actions. The PFA has also organised the, the Enough campaign, which led to the boycott of social media companies reaching over 90 million users worldwide and was heavily supported by players across the globe. Further action was taken with the football and multi-stakeholder boycott at the end of April this year. The PFA has also commissioned groundbreaking studies and reports monitoring players' accounts so, to, so that our arguments are backed up by the data and are evidence-based. The key findings are shocking and disturbing and sadly show that online abuse is getting worse. Furthermore, and of course for more concern, our studies also highlight the fact that players who speak out are further targeted by abusers. Unions are familiar with negotiating with companies and organisations to protect their members, but at times the only way forward is to call on government to take a lead and legislate. The online safety bill is a welcome development and the powers of regulation and the, of the social media companies contained within the bill as it stands represents real progress. However, we believe that in addition, discriminatory content and hate speech should be made priority illegal content and should be accountable under specific codes of practice. This would place an increased obligation on service providers to take positive steps to minimise abusive content on their platforms. There also needs to be a review of the legislation used by law enforcement agencies to tackle this form of abuse, as this currently predates the onset of social media. We also believe that the legislation should include enforcement powers for the Secretary of State, which widens the responsibility beyond the regulator to bring about real change. Congress. In conclusion, I am sure that Congress will agree that this modern day method of purveying abhorrent racist and discriminatory abuse has got to be challenged in the strongest terms. Trade unions and the TUC has a proud history of fighting racism and discrimination, and we call on your support in this very important battle. As a nation, we all recognise the skill, commitment and determination of our players during the recent Euro Championships. The England team in getting to the final raised our spirits in what has been the most difficult of times. The team deserve huge credit for what they achieved, and they also deserve our support and the commitment from us to do everything possible to root out racism wherever it rears its ugly head. The vile online abuse received by Bakayo Saka, Marcus Rashford and Jadon Sancho after the Euro final has to some extent brought matters to a head. But this kind of appalling treatment has been suffered by players on social media for years. Congress, the racists have found a new haven for their despicable ways. It is high time we put a stop to this. We need to force government to act now, hold social media companies to account, bring the perpetrators to justice and ensure that the punishments and consequences fit the crime. I move. Thank you very much indeed, Nick, for your contribution. Um, I call the seconder, Hannah Barber from CSP.
Good morning. President of Congress, Hannah Barber from the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy. I offer the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy solidarity with Marcus Rashford, Akea Saka and Jaden Sancho. Everybody in the football community should be able to pursue their livelihoods and love for the beautiful game free from discrimination. This goes for players. This also goes for my union members, their team physios. This goes for all pitch side and backroom staff and it also goes for all match day fans. Attending a football match is, for many, an introduction to collective action, an introduction to community mobilisation. When discrimination pushes somebody out of the sport, we've lost not only a player, a team physio or a fan, we've also lost a potential trade unionist, a potential union steward. We must therefore redouble our efforts to push racism and all other forms of discrimination out of the game. My union is a proud supporter of Show Racism the Red Card. We recognise the positive impact that grassroots education initiatives can have in combating discrimination. However, despite the progress made by this and many other great initiatives, I'm appalled by the persistent nature of racial abuse, including online abuse. The abuse we saw this summer did not emerge from a vacuum. This indefensible behaviour was encouraged and sustained by those in position of privilege. High profile public figures failed to condemn it. Others explained or legitimised the horrific abuse. In this toxic environment, our movement must redouble our efforts to combat abuse wherever we find it, to stand in solidarity with those who experience it, and to give voice to those less heard. Those of us like me with unearned privilege must strive to understand that and to use it in our work to bring about an end to racism and all other forms of inequality and discrimination. Congress, our support for this composite is part of the efforts. Tighter regulation of social media companies that support the fight for the rights of all workers and others online is essential to prevent online harassment. Please support this composite. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Hannah, for your contribution. Um, we have an, another speaker in debate. Um, can I welcome Pauline Twigg from the RCM? Hello, Congress. Hello, delegates. Hello, President. Pauline Twig, Royal College and Midwives. Um, RCM amendment. The abuse and threats to NHS staff, public servants and their unions, whether online or on site, must stop. The pandemic has seen a major increase in this. And Congress calls on social media platforms, employers and government to take action to counteract and protect. I am so proud to be supporting this motion. Social media has enabled racism for far too long. The RCM stands with our colleagues at the PFA and wholeheartedly supports the call for stronger legislation and robust regulation. My own General Secretary, Jill Walton, has recently been the target of online abuse after appearing on interviews to support the recommendations that all pregnant women have a COVID vaccination. She was compared to Myra Hindley, accused of causing harm to women and babies and much, much worse. I wonder whether there is an ounce of regret from Michael Gove when he thinks back to his, the people of this country have had enough of experts comment, as well as we now see healthcare professionals being targeted and abused for giving evidence-based advice. Just the other week, anti-vaxxers attempted to force entry to the offices of the Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulation Authority in London. Before that, thousands of people in Trafalgar Square cheered when someone referred to the Nuremberg trials and what happened. Last year, an RCM member survey found that seven out of 10 had experienced abuse or aggression, either from those in their care, their partners or visitors. This simply is not good enough. Midwives, maternity support workers and all health professionals deserve our support and respect for the huge contribution they have made during the pandemic and in normal times. And the very least we deserve to go to work or online and feel safe, not abused for doing our job. Please support this motion. Thank you very, very much, um, Pauline, for your contribution. 
Accord are also party to the composite but do not wish to speak. So thank you to all speakers. As there's no oppo opposition, the composite motion is carried. So I call paragraph 3.11 and composite motion 9, strengthening regulatory bodies. The General Council support the composite motion. The composite motion will be moved by Angela Butler from NASUWT and then seconded by Eleanor Wade from Prospect. Um, Angela, you're very welcome. Good morning, all President, Congress, Angela Butler, NASUWT, the Teachers Union, move in Motion 41, Composite 9, strengthening regulatory bodies. The COVID-19 pandemic threw into sharp relief and focus many different aspects of the society in which we live. We were tested more in this last year as a nation and more acutely than we had been since the Second World War. The pandemic exposed the great strengths of our society, but also exposed weaknesses. One of those weaknesses was in the enforcement of regulations that are there to protect us, there to ensure our health and safety, there to ensure that our human rights are protected. As trade unions, we have a proud history of fighting for rights for working people, rights to work safely, to decent paying conditions, and to be free of harassment and discrimination. However, a lack of enforcement renders these rights meaningless for many. A prime example of the lack of enforcement of adequate regulations was the Grenfell Tower fire, where the cladding used did not comply to the relevant standards and yet was still used on that building and many others. The HSE's budget has been slashed by 60% since 2010, which has meant a substantial drop in the number of inspectors and therefore a drop, drop in the number of workplace inspections. Research by the International Labour Organization has found that a 32% drop in the number of inspectors since 2010 in the UK. Congress, this is the second highest drop in the EU. The latest figures show that there are now less than 1,000 HSE inspectors in this country. The number of successful prosecutions by HSE has also almost halved during this time. Local authorities have experienced similar cuts which have had a devastating impact on their ability to carry out enforcement activities. At the same time, the number of workers, working days lost due to workplace accident or illness has increased from 26.4 million to 28.2 million. The annual cost to society of work-related injury and ill health is now estimated to be 15 billion pounds. Compare this to the HSE's budget of 136 million. For Congress, as I said in my introduction, this weakness has been laid bare during the pandemic. During the pandemic, the HSE had to be given emergency funding to recruit outsourced inspectors to carry out spot checks. In schools, these spot checks were carried out via telephone, with schools rapidly becoming aware of the questions that would be asked and so able to prepare responses. Nevertheless, a number of schools were found to be deficient, and yet the NASEWT is not aware of any prosecutions that have resulted. Worse still, although around 10% of schools were found to be deficient and required advice, and 1% required formal intervention, the spot check system was discontinued after only 5,000 were completed. Not even a quarter of schools. Congress, the Education Service has one of the highest rates of work-related stress, anxiety, and depression. The NASEWT is not aware of any enforcement activity in relation to this, and it remains non-reportable under RIDO. But it's not just the HSE and the LAs that have had reduced inspections and enforcement. Fire protection teams have been reduced by over a third since 2011, with fire safety audits and prosecutions dropping as a result. Members of NASUWT have reported concerns about issues with fire safety in schools, ranging from fire drawers being propped open and even removed to fire alarm systems not working. Yet the chances of a proactive enforcement visit is remote. Congress, enforcing human rights and anti-discrimination measures are key features of the role of the EHRC. The impact of the coronavirus has shone a light on the multiple areas of institutional and systemic discrimination experienced by many workers, many of whom kept this country going during the pandemic. Despite this, we have seen continued deterioration of the statutory power, powers of the EHRC due to lack of sufficient resources from the government in order to undertake their regulatory duties. Congress, nothing is more important than protecting the lives and life chances of working people in this country. 
This is not just the blue light services and the NHS that do that. The regular, regulatory bodies are crucial. Cuts in the HSE, EHRC and LAs have allowed bad, dangerous and discriminatory practices to flourish. Never was there more clearly exposed than during the pandemic. Congress, we need to highlight these failings in the forth forthcoming public inquiry. But more importantly, we need to lobby to increase budgets to boost regulatory powers and allow these bodies to do the crucial job that they were set up to do. Congress, please support the composite. Thank you very much indeed, Angela. Um, I'll call Eleanor Wade from Prospect to second. You're very, you're very. Um, Eleanor, unfortunately, you're on mute. So if you can unmute yourself. I've just unmuted myself on Zoom. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Lovely. Okay. President Congress, Ellie Wade, Prospect, seconding this motion with um, great thanks to NASUWT for raising this issue because it, it is critical. Effective regulation is an economic enabler, but it absolutely must be properly funded. Health and safety inspectors, along with policymakers and scientists at the Health and Safety Executive, are Prospect members, and we're proud to represent them and many other regulators who do such important work. We know that effective health and safety regulation isn't about shutting businesses down. It's about scientists and policymakers working to understand what measures businesses need to take so that they can keep working safely, especially with new threats like COVID. And it's about inspectors on the ground providing support and advice, helping businesses to stay open, protecting workers. The health and safety executive's job is to help good employers to do the right thing and to help those and to catch those who are trying to evade their responsibilities. That's what regulators do. But the health and safety executive has seen relentless cuts in the last decade, as we've heard. Its budget cut by more than half since 2010. And we're now in the position where there are fewer health and safety inspectors than MPs. So that's less than one per parliamentary constituency. So of course, when the government needed to regulate the safe reopening of workplaces, um, as we've heard, the health and safety executive was forced to use additional funding to recruit retired and outsourced inspectors to deliver COVID spot checks using short-term funding. This tick box exercise was not the professional support businesses needed to respond to such a difficult new threat. And it didn't give workers or the public the confidence that their safety was being protected. The knowledge and skills lost to the health and safety executive and other regulators through years of underfunding, the loss of experienced policymakers, scientists and inspectors will take time and investment to rebuild. It's vital that these cuts are reversed and sustainable funding provided. Workers across the UK deserve to be kept safe and treated fairly at work. The government must fill the gap in our defences and fully fund all of our regulators, must reverse the cuts to the health and safety executives made since 2010 and substantially increase the number of inspectors. I hope you can support this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, and we have another speaker in the debate, um, Ben Selby from the FBU. Ben, you're welcome. Thank you, President. Congress, Ben Selby, Vice President, Fire Brigade Union. The FBU welcomes the focus of this composite on regulatory bodies. For more than 40 years, we've faced Westminster government and business-driven deregulation, along with privatisation and contracting out. Starting with Thatcher, continued by Labour, and supercharged again by the Tories along with austerity, they deregulated so their friends could profit. Ministers consciously and deliberately ran down the regulations and the regulators that kept people said, safe. As Angela said, the Grenfell Tower fire exposed the role of deregulations. Homes were clad with flammable materials because the rules were too lax and they were not enforced. The FBU and I'm sure Congress stands in solidarity with the bereaved, the survivors and the residents of the Grenfell Tower. The residents warned and the FBU warned of the dangers of deregulation before that fire. The tragic Grenfell Tower fire confirmed what we all already knew, that cuts cost lives. Every regulatory body has faced cuts in recent years and fire authorities, well, they're no exception. 
Despite the Grenfell Tower fire and other disasters, the number of fire inspections has con uh, continued to fall. There are now fewer than 1,000 fire inspectors in England. That's over a third since the turn of the century. This has meant a steady decline in the number of inspections despite the enormous risk increase. It has also meant that fewer enforcement notices are handed out and fewer prosecutions. Our fire inspectors work tremendously hard, but their workloads, well, they're enormous. They will tell you what they've told the fire brigade union. For regulation to work, there must be enforcement. And for enforcement, there must be inspectors to carry out the necessary visits and deal with those landlords and businesses that flout fire safety law. Ministers now expect our members to put right the failed system that they ran down for 40 years. However, they're not providing the resources necessary to train more professional firefighters in fire inspection. New fire safety legislation came on the statute book this year. There's more to follow with a building safety bill. Bill after bill, yet ministers have offered very little extra funding to pay for the extra work. Congress, regulators keep everyone safe. We pay tribute to fire inspectors, health and safety inspectors, local authority building control, and all other hardworking enforcement officers. Support this resolution and put a marker down so we can campaign to force ministers to fund these vital public servants. Thank you, Congress. Solidarity. And thank you very much, Ben, and to all speakers. As there is no opposition, the composite motion is carried. We now turn to our debate on learning and skills. I call paragraphs 3.12 to 3.15 and composite motion four, tackling the UK skills gap and boosting maritime training. The general council support the composite motion. The composite motion will be moved by Caroline Armstrong from community and then seconded by Mark Dickinson from Nautilus. So, Caroline, um, you're very welcome uh, to move. Thank you. Thank you. President, Congress, Caroline Armstrong, Community Trade, Trade Union, moving composite four on tackling the UK skills gap. Our motion tells you some of the statistics. 11.3 million people without the basic digital skills they need millions without the basic literacy and numeracy skills. What those statistics can't tell you is the stories of the people behind those numbers. People who had bad experiences at school, maybe came away with few or no qualifications, and now might feel like they are stuck because they don't have the necessary skills to move on from their current jobs or have the opportunity to explore new ones. There are thousands of people feeling like this across the country. I've been able to see firsthand the difference that giving people the skills they need to thrive makes. It literally transforms people's lives. Congress, helping people get on in life has always been at the heart of the trade union movement. Our work to equip our members with the skills they need is something that every representative listening here today should be incredibly proud of. I know so many people, and all of you listening today will know someone too, whose life has been transformed by the power of learning. But Congress, the skills challenge that this country faces is actually becoming more acute and the net will continue to tighten. Work is changing more and more rapidly. New skills will be required to work in the green industries of the future. Jobs will be created as part of this exciting new development. But remember, it's the workforce of today who need to be equipped to step into these roles. Workers should be able to get new and better jobs as the world of work changes. But for this to happen, they must receive the upskilling and reskilling that they need. Too many employers have been unwilling to invest in training. Yet we know that when employers take the steps to do what's right, they benefit along with the workers. Employers benefit from having a loyal, dedicated workforce contributing new ideas. They benefit from having skilled people on their team which is why they must do their bit to help workers to upskill and reskill. Congress, we were incredibly disappointed to see the government cut the Union Learning Fund, one of the most important pathways for people to access learning. For more than 20 years, the Union Learn helped people, 
stop them from being left behind. And it's a legacy we should be incredibly proud of. We must continue to do what we can to maintain this legacy. The TUC must keep skills high on the agenda. That's why this motion calls for support for union campaigns to publicize training opportunities and the importance of skills development. We need to see a much expanded adult skills system in the UK. This means widening the free entitlement, giving people support to earn while they train and offering statutory training pay so that people can afford to take time away from their day jobs to study. We need to see priority qualifications available to people so they can get the skills in their area needs and give local authorities a much greater control over their local skills needs. The UK skills gap is holding our workforce back. With the world of work changing quicker than ever, there's never been a more important time to breach that gap. Congress, please support. Thank you very much indeed, Caroline, for that contribution. Um, can I call, please, Mark Dickinson from Nautilus to second? You're welcome, Mark. Thank you, President, uh, Congress. Uh, my name is Mark Dickinson. I'm the General Secretary of Nautilus International, the Union for Maritime Professionals, and I rise to speak in support of composite number four. Colleagues, during the darkest days of the pandemic, the, the work of our seafarers, both our members working in the industry in the UK and those working all around the world came into stark relief as they worked throughout to provide the food for our tables, the medicines for our hospitals, and the PPE for our frontline workers. When the world seemed to grind to a halt, CIFRAs kept on working to provide us with 95% of everything. Despite the ongoing reliance on shipping and the CIFRAs that work in the industry and recognition that they are and were key workers, Nautilus International is here today once again to highlight the shortfall in investment this country is making into its maritime skills base. Over the last 40 years, the numbers of British officers has fallen by around two thirds and consistent under recruitment means the total is predicted to fall by a further 30% over the next decade. The situation for British ratings is even worse. We are a maritime nation we are dependent on the sea. Unless urgent action is taken to reduce the continued decline in our maritime skill base, we will become dependent on the nations of others to provide our basic necessities. This places our national resilience, our competitiveness, our sustainability, and our maritime security in jeopardy. We know that falling UK CIFRA numbers is not caused by a shortage of young people wishing to embark on a maritime career, because applications for cadetships continue to far outstrip the number of training positions. After all, not many other careers provide the opportunities that maritime does for our young people. The problem is the lack of opportunity for places. A training model which has not evolved with the increased use of technology in shipping, a lack of commitment from shipping companies, and insufficient long-term funding and support from government. Nautilus International has been working hard with our social partners to address these issues, and we are pleased to be part of the newly formed Maritime Skills Commission established by the government in support of its Maritime 2050 strategy. One key output of the Maritime Skills Commission is a report looking at the training experience of cadets. It was published in June this year, we were heavily involved in that work and we supported it with research conducted amongst our young and recently qualified members. The report provides a blueprint for the kind of modernized UK Merchant Navy training that can begin to reverse this worrying decline in our skills base. The report's vital recommendations, including for more funding, must not be allowed to sit on the shelf gathering dust. We need a firm commitment from government to provide 100% of the cost of training and up-to-date training curriculum, which reflects the work of CFRS today and in the future, and support to encourage more graduates to consider careers in shipping. 
President, Congress, please support the composite motion and thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. And we have uh, two uh, other contributions in this debate. Um, first, I'll call Janet Farah from UCU. Janet, you're welcome. Thank you very much, President, and good morning, Congress. Um, I'm Janet Farah, President-elect of UCU, and a first-time speaker. Um, speaking to uh, in favour of Composite Motion 4 on tackling the UK skills gap and, and boosting maritime training, and to move UCU's amendment, I'd like to start by thanking community and Nautilus for raising these important issues. Uh, we're fully supportive of the motion and wanted to take the opportunity to highlight the role of our members in further education uh, in the vital upskilling of workers, particularly in the digital age and uh, in the recovery from the pandemic. I've spent the last decade teaching in FE, um, and I can say from personal experience and as a student too, um, that FE transforms lives. Um, FE enriches communities and it provides educational opportunities to everyone, young and old, and uh, everything in between. Yet funding per student in further education and sixth form colleges fell by 12% in real terms uh, between 2011 and 2020. And spending on adult education is 50% lower uh, than in 2010. This falls mainly driven by a removal of public funding from some courses and a resultant drop in learner numbers, which fell from 4.4 million in 2005 to 1.5 million um, by 2019. Government says it wants to upskill the nation and level up, but the plans are deeply flawed. The plans for upskilling are built on loans and on a narrow instrumental view of education. The skills of our nation shouldn't be built on the back of mounting individual debt on proper long-term public investment that ensures everyone can access the learning they need. And just as it says it wants to upskill the nation, the government has axed union learn, stripping away opportunities for millions of workers to boost their skills. The government says it wants to close the gulf between FE and the rest of education, but it has failed to close the £9,000 pay gap between FE and school teachers and sixth form teachers. Investment in colleges has failed to translate into investment in staff, with the value of FE pay in England falling by over 30% in real terms over the last decade. Over 24,000 teaching staff have left FE since 2010 a huge loss of talent and expertise. We need to turn the tide, rebuild our FE sector and invest properly in the staff who go above and beyond to support adults and young people to get the skills they need for the future. That's why UCU is fighting for fair paying conditions in colleges and that's why we'll need the full weight of the movement behind us in our forthcoming industrial action. Please support this motion and its amendment. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Janet. Um, and the final speaker, I'll call Mick Carney from TSSA. Mick, you're welcome. Uh, Mick Carney, TSSA President. The skills gap in the rail industry is already serious and in the coming few years, it's likely to reach a crisis point. Once again, the Tories are looking to cut their way out of a crisis in our rail industry. Cuts to services and cuts to jobs. Primarily, these jobs cuts are aimed at older workers and as they leave the industry, with them goes experience and skills, which the government and the rail companies have failed to replace. A recent report in, by the City and Guilds and National Skills Academy for Rail highlights this issue. A potential gap with up to 120,000 additional people required over the next five years and this is before any job losses. An ageing workforce where currently up to 30% of all staff are over 50. There is a clear need to attract more and younger people into the rail industry, not less. You don't solve a crisis by cutting away um, clean green transport links. This is the sort of narrow-minded thinking that has been shown over many years from Beeching to McNulty and now to the Shaps Williams report. When people do start travelling again, and they will, they need a clean, green rail industry to meet that demand. Uh, conference, please, Paul. 
Thank you ever so much, Mick, um, and to all speakers. As there's no opposition, the composite motion is carried. Congress, the remainder of this session will focus on our recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'll first introduce a video dedicated to our key workers. We'll then hear from our General Secretary, who will move our first General Council statement. After the pandemic, a trade union action plan for a just, resilient future. Finally, I will take Composite Motion 1 and Motion 8 as one debate. I think we'll all agree our amazing key workers in every walk of life across every part of the country, it was their hard work and dedication that got us through this crisis. And yet the government has still recognised that with a proper pay rise or the strong working rights they need, they will uh, remain feeling neglected by government. So um, let's have a look at this video. Uh, in my vocation, uh, I'm a delivery driver, obviously feeding the nation. Nobody can come and fight your fights. You yourself can fight your fight. What education is going to need is the critical thinkers and the problem solvers. When I go to work on a 24-hour shift, their lives are in my hands. What justice means to me is that everybody gets to receive what is rightfully uh, theirs, treated properly, and also fairness at work. It was a fear. No one knew what was coming. And then suddenly you're finding yourself, you're the only car in the street moving in the morning. COVID showed us that um, we are all equal and we need to, to live in a certain way. Staff on national minimum wage were only just managing anyway, but to take a pay cut on top of it through the pandemic, staff have been struggling. There, there are bills to pay. There's rent to pay, there are kids to take care of. The amount I received was not even enough to pay, I think, for a meal. I started relying now on food banks. It was horrible for me. We work with fast machinery, high speeds, heavy volumes of goods. And the challenge is how do we continue flowing without people endangering their, their lives? In the latter part of, of last year, I lost um, six family members, three to COVID. Um, uh, I suffered a heart attack myself, all through the stress. I felt I was letting people down because the time I had to have off work due to my heart attack, I should have been in work. Too many times you see little things that could have been done correctly uh, so that people get by in a harmonious way. One of the things as a, a union rep that we would really like to see is more protection uh, and more consideration for people that are gonna have to face long COVID symptoms. There has to be a lot more support and understanding there. Social care, really needs addressing uh, because it's a crisis. We're at breaking point. These people are doing an absolutely wonderful job. They're amazing people. Your taxi drivers, your binmen, your postmen, your care workers, the delivery drivers, the supermarket people. We haven't had proper recognition. We were promised as key workers we would be recognised and valued. It was all there every day. Keep the people going, but not much accolade for them. Join the fight. Join the fight because if you do not fight for yourself, we shall continuously cry and say and talk about how we are suffering, how nobody is looking out for us, how nothing is being done for us. When we ourselves can go out there and ensure that what we'd like to be done for us can be done for us. Massive thanks to Edel, Samson, Alan, Carol and Philippa for that sunny afternoon meet-up in Middleton. You know what, Congress? It was a joy to talk with such decent and dedicated people. And those conversations are happening now in workplaces and around kitchen tables up and down the country. What we've learned from the pandemic, what needs to change, 
and how working people can win a fair deal. What struck me on the train home was something that Carol said. She looks after adults with complex needs. You heard her say it. When she starts a 24-hour shift, the lives of the people she supports are in her hands. She's right. But what, what's Carol's reward for a 24-hour shift? Less than the national minimum wage. That's why the TUC is calling for a rise in capital gains tax to fund social care so the service gets the money it desperately needs, not in a few years, not maybe, but now, so that every social care worker's pay rises to at least £10 an hour, and so that wealth is taxed at the same rate as people who work for a living. Because it can't be right that a dedicated care worker pays a bigger share of her hard-earned hard income than the private equity magnate who profits from buying up and selling on homes. So I say this to Chancellor Rishi Sunak. Go and work in Carol's care home for a week. Put in the same shifts and try living off her pay. Congress, instead of raiding low-paid workers' wage packets, the government should think again. Tax wealth to fund social care. After all, the pandemic showed on whose shoulders society is built. The true value of labour, who carries us, who keeps us going, and the balance of power can shift. Union membership is growing, and in key industries, staff shortages are beginning to bite. We've seen the headlines, Nando's running out of chicken, Ikea running out of mattresses, Weatherspoons running out of beer. Suddenly, supply chains matter. The people who keep essential supplies moving should matter too. But after long hours, many HGV drivers are sleeping in their cabs on laybys. No payments for truck stops, no place to wash, no toilet facilities, treated worse than animals. Ministers may scratch their heads about how to protect supply chains and fill vacancies. Well, here's a novel idea. Invite unions in with employers, get us around the table, and let's make that industry deliver decent conditions, direct employment, and a proper pay rise. And let's be clear, after decades of real wage cuts and falling living standards, no one can seriously say working people don't deserve a pay rise. I can tell you today just how much workers have lost out since the global financial crash. If pay had continued to grow at its pre-crash rates, the average worker would be £5,900 better off. No wonder household budgets are feeling the pinch. And economists agree, the biggest threat we face is low demand. And the way to fix low demand is to pay higher wages. Because working people don't hoard what they earn in offshore tax havens, they spend their wages in local high streets. And that's what drives the real economy. This is a moment of opportunity for working people. The task for us as unions is to bring it home. This movement is ready. Look at our wins from the past year, not least that momentous deal. After years of campaigning and fighting in the courts, our union, GMB, is now recognised by Uber. Total union membership is rising, especially among women. The face of our union movement is changing too. For every Dave and Len, there is now a Christina and a Sharon. Britain's two biggest unions, led by women, 21st century trade unionism. In the pandemic, unions have shown the value we bring when we're in the room and our voices are heard. But look at the price we all pay when unions are shut out and ignored. 
Who can doubt that we could have slowed down the virus if everyone had had decent sick pay, just like the TUC called for from day one? Or if care workers had got proper PPE from the start? Or if bad bosses who put staff safety at risk had felt the full force of the law prosecuted and fined? We know that we're all better off when unions are listened to. Just look at furlough, an idea forged in the engine room of the trade union movement, because we knew we had to prevent mass unemployment, stop firms going under and save livelihoods. When the business lobby wanted loans, we demanded cash in the pockets of working people. Look, furlough may not be perfect, but it saved nearly 12 million jobs and it helped our economy bounce back faster. It was a great union idea and it is a great union achievement. Never again in time of crisis should the British people settle for unemployment on miserable subsistence. We have proved that there is an alternative and we in this movement will never let any government forget there are two massive lessons of the pandemic. Get unions in the room. Your policy will be better if you listen to the voices of working people and use the power of government to back working families. The third lesson of the pandemic is this. We must start from equality. There are times over the last 18 months when ministers seem to live on a different planet. They didn't listen or seem to understand about workplace overcrowding and how that makes social distancing impossible, that not everyone has a garden or a spare room to work from home, that we're not all waiting for an Amazon delivery. Some of us are making that Amazon delivery, that millions don't get decent sick pay and have no choice but to keep on working to feed their families. And frankly, they don't seem to care when schools and childcare closed, that it was working women who picked up the slack. And they chose not to see that structural racism in the jobs market and what that means for many black workers. It's still a case of last in, first out. And that as our anti-racist task force showed, black and ethnic minority workers are concentrated in key worker jobs more at risk of the virus, more likely to get it, more likely to die. Or that six in 10, six in 10 of all COVID deaths were of disabled people. And now ministers tell us they're going to level up Britain. But leveling up means nothing if they freeze workers' pay, slash universal credit, and the number of kids in poverty soars. So I have a challenge for the Prime Minister. If levelling up means anything, it must mean levelling up at work and levelling up living standards. So looking ahead over the next 5, 10, 20 years, it's clear that economic shocks will grow and intensify in the UK and around the world. COVID is not going to be a one-off. Years of austerity took their toll and meant we fought this pandemic with one hand tied behind our backs. The UK must be better prepared for crises in the future, and they're coming. Climate chaos is here already. The longer we put off getting to net zero, the more disruptive it will be. New tech, offers new opportunities, but also poses old threats to jobs, and the market will not save us. In an age of anxiety, working people are crying out for security. We must build an economy that can withstand the shocks and help working families face the future with confidence. Rather than reeling from every fresh crisis that unleashes rampant insecurity, and inequality anew. If the PM is serious about levelling up, this is what he should do. First, just as other countries do, we need a ready-made 
short time working scheme to keep people in good jobs and to make sure we bounce back fast. As the world changes, the skills we need change too and people need income security to have confidence to upskill and switch careers. Climate chaos this summer has writ large the urgency of getting to net zero, but we must do it with justice. No one deserves to lose their livelihood. Britain could lead the world with a real industrial strategy to make every job a good, skilled, green job. We need that justice for the change that comes with new tech too. AI, robotics, automation, the gains from increased productivity must be shared with working people through higher pay or shorter working hours. And we can't let tech make working life worse, managed by algorithm, fired by artificial intelligence. That's why we need new rights over our own data and the right to switch off. Secondly, we need to invest for the nation's long-term infrastructure, and that includes rebuilding our public services, battered first by austerity and then by COVID. The government must take that opportunity at the spending review, invest in public services, fix social care, mend the NHS and our education system, and give our key workers the pay rise they have earned. And thirdly, we need a new deal for working people, a strong set of rights from day one. Peace of mind that you can do a good job and be a good parent too, including the right to guaranteed hours, the flexibility to swap shifts and proper compensation when they are cancelled at short notice. Let's ban zero hours contracts and bogus self-employment. And Congress, it can't be right that a boss can threaten to sack loyal workers, often after years of service, unless they accept worse paying conditions. It's high time we outlawed that evil practice of fire and rehire. COVID must be a catalyst for real change. We need an economy that treats everyone with dignity, that rewards hard work, that helps working families and communities thrive. An economy where everyone can get on in life, regardless of our race, religion or background. This is the true test of levelling up. Let's be clear, that New Deal must be global too. Government has now agreed to invite unions onto advisory groups on trade deals. Better late than never. And alongside our friends in America and all around the world, we will be clear about what we want written into those trade deals. Protecting public services from privatisation, defending good jobs, and cracking down on companies that abuse labour standards. Trade deals that do nothing to stop abuse of workers' rights do workers in Britain, don't do workers in Britain any favours. No worker wins in a race to the bottom. No worker wins when migrants and refugees are scapegoated. No worker can win on their own. That's why unions exist. Working people sticking together, so together everyone gets a fair deal. President Biden gets it. He's already started building a new deal for working America. He knows, and we know, that the foundation of a fair economy is decent work paying the union rate for the job. That's the way to build back a fairer Britain too. So to level up, working people must have freedom to organise, to bargain, to protest, and yes, to strike when we need to. For too long, big corporations like Amazon have had far too much power. It's time to level the playing field. Now, we know that rights at work aren't handed down. 
We must campaign and organize to win. I am constantly inspired by the power and resilience of working people and by what we can achieve by working together in this country and across borders. Strong unions perform a great public service in this country, exposing exploitation, giving working people a voice and a chance to get on in life and winning that fair deal. Brothers and sisters, we've got work to do. Let's get to it. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Francis. It feels really weird I can't give you a hug. Um, and thank you for your leadership during this incredibly challenging period. Thank you. We now turn to section one of the General Counsel report, leading the response to the COVID-19 recovery from page 12. I call paragraphs 1.1 to 1.7 and Composite Motion 1, Recover and Rebuild, a post-pandemic plan for public services and safety at work. The General Council support the Composite Motion. The Composite Motion will be moved by Christina McEnay from Unison and seconded by Patrick Roach from the NASUWT. Christina, you are very welcome. Thank you, Gail. Uh, and can I can I just thank Gail and, and Francis in particular for uh, the fantastic leadership you've shown, um, particularly during this last difficult year. And I know I'm sure everyone would agree with me. You've been amazing, and the coverage we've got has been fantastic. Um, Congress uh, President Christina McInnes, General Secretary of Unison, and um, I, I'm sure you don't need me uh, uh, to to remind you of the profound effect that COVID has had on public services and other workers. The sacrifice, the loss of life, the strain on physical and mental health and the economic repercussions will be held, felt for generations. But the Westminster government, as we know, sadly does need to be reminded. And they do need to be told in no uncertain terms that they must listen to the voices of the workers who carried us all through this crisis. And we, as the representatives of those workers, have the right to make those demands loud and clear. In unison, we represent uh, many workers who deliver services in almost every part of the public sector that we've all relied on. Congress, even the World Bank, described the pandemic as a heat-seeking missile speeding towards the most vulnerable in society. And as has already been said, we've all seen the disproportionate impact on different parts of society. And this isn't a coincidence or bad luck, and it certainly isn't down to life choices. It's because so many of those people who were so badly affected by it were likely to be in jobs that can't be done from home. Cleaners and catering staff, bus delivery and transport workers, care and health workers, and workers who emptied their bins and buried their dead. Those are just a few of the people who still had to go to work, however bad things go. And for most low paid workers, that meant using public transport. It meant getting up close and personal with other people. And for too many, their precarious employment status meant it was difficult to speak up about PPE or health and safety issues. Time and again, our members and other essential workers were exposed needlessly to danger. Remember the early months of the pandemic? Workers wearing PPE made out of old bin bags and face masks made from bits of clothing. Care workers given disposable face masks and told to make them last a week. That was the reality back then. And we must do everything in our power to make sure this never happens again. So it is important that we call for a public inquiry to learn those lessons. Because each one of those workers who died, each person in this country who lost a family member or a loved one, and everyone whose life has been turned upside down by COVID has the right to answers. And we must demand that those who exploited this pandemic are held to account. The cronies of government ministers, family members, and even government ministers themselves shockingly, involved in shady deals where companies sprang up literally overnight, claiming to be able to get PPE deals that either never materialised or were so shoddy they couldn't be used. 
And even when services and equipment were provided, the profits made were eye-watering. What they did was profiteering, plain and simple. And we need answers because if we don't learn from these mistakes, if the government doesn't learn from these mistakes, we will inevitably end up repeating them with similar dire consequences. This virus has shown us who we really depend on when the chips are down. And so we have a right to demand a new deal for public services and a new deal for workers. Because if there's any lesson that can be learned from this pandemic, is that no society can survive without reliable and sustainable public services or the dedication and commitment of those workers who keep those and other essential services going. So we are now at a major economic and moral crossroads. Those same workers being offered either a pay freeze or pay deals that deliver real-term pay cuts. And yet when the next crisis comes along, and sadly it will come along, we will still be relying on those workers and those services. So only a new deal in a post-pandemic world world will secure our future. So let's repay the dedication and commitment of those workers. It's time to call for an end to the old business as usual. Let's get a new deal for them that will strip out profit-making from public services, guarantee long-term and sustainable funding for public services, Let's call for an employment bill, as Francis has just said, that puts an end to zero-hour contract and fire and rehire. Let's have pay that keeps up with inflation. Let's have an ambitious living wage. In short, we're calling for a fair and decent society. And you know what? That's not too much to ask for, Congress. Because we're not being greedy or unrealistic. Because if we're not speaking up for our members, then who will? And if this is not the right time to call for a, a, a new deal, then when will be the right time? We have a strong and collective voice. We can, we must, and we will use it. We know we're stronger together. So let's work together as unions to bring about the change needed to get the fair society that we all need. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Christina. Um, that was great. Um, so if I can call on Patrick Roach, uh, please, from the NASUWT to second. Patrick, you're very welcome. President, <coughs> Congress, Patrick Roach, NASUWT, the Teachers' Union, seconding composite motion number one, on a post-pandemic plan for public services and safety at work, and really privileged to be following on from Christina McInee from Unison. Congress, there can be no recovery from this pandemic without investment in our children and young people. Over the last decade, many families have been plunged into poverty as a result of a ruthlessly pursued policy of austerity, which has had profound consequences for our children's lives and their life chances. And in the last 18 months, we've seen many more families ending up on the breadline without the means to feed their children when schools were closed. You know, all credit to Marcus Rashford, but it shouldn't take a footballer to have to tell the government to wake up to the realities of the poverty and deprivation endured by too many of our children for so long. At least nine pupils in every class of 30 lives in a household in poverty. Tens of thousands of poorer families and children are forced to live in substandard accommodation far from their schools or community networks. Since 2010, the social safety net has been raided by this government with savage budget cuts and now the appalling attacks on universal credit. The policies of austerity have stripped young people of dignity, opportunity and confidence for their future. These are the realities for many of our children, realities that will continue to have profound and lasting consequences for years to come unless there's determined action from the government. Not shortcut measures, not education recovery on the cheap, as the government's announced, consigning our children and young people to the slow lane internationally. Congress, we're not out of this pandemic. 
which has been made worse by years of chronic underinvestment in our public services. So we need investment now to ensure our schools and colleges can continue to provide the best for our children. And we need a roadmap to secure the post-pandemic recovery that has children and young people at the centre. A roadmap that delivers more than just hand claps and warm words, but real investment, not pay cuts for teachers and the wider workforce in our schools, because our children deserve better. Congress, the government says that it wants our children to catch up on lost learning, but our members, workers, parents, carers, and their families know what's needed. A catch-up program to remedy the real terms cuts to school and college and local authority spending, and an end to the crisis in teacher morale, which today means that two out of three teachers are seriously considering quitting the job. Schools and colleges didn't create this crisis, and our children and young people shouldn't be left to pick up the pieces left by this pandemic and the decisions taken by this government. Congress, please support the composite. I second. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, Congress, we have uh, other speakers, uh, understandably, um, 10 other speakers in this debate. Um, may I just appeal to speakers, please keep to time. Um, three minutes is the uh, ceiling, just a quick reminder from me. Um, if I can introduce uh, Tony Kearns, please, from the CWU. Tony, first up. Thank you. President, uh, Congress, Tony Kearns, communication workers, um, as part of the Composite, deal with those issues in the Composite that were part of our motion, um, which is why we talked about the deep structural imbalances that we see in society and wealth in power, um, in work, in the economy and in society. And these have been decades in the making, but undoubtedly, they've been um, accelerated or exacerbated um, by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're right to demand more pay, as a number of speakers have done this morning. But we need to address the issue of who provides health services, who provides national care, and who provides housing needs for those who can't afford it. And what we're saying is what we need is a new social movement led by the trade union movement that builds a community, that campaigns, that builds a community that, that fires into action but what we need to establish is around what? What is our agenda for this? That's why we reference um, in our motion and in part of this composite, that's why we reference the beverage report. We need, if you like, a 1945 moment. We need a comprehensive system of social insurance from the cradle to the grave. And it's about looking after the sick. It's about looking after the elderly. And it's also about looking after the unemployed. And we need this plan and we need it now. This is why we call for it to be in place before the end of 2021. But we have to set out some key aims. We have to tackle the issue of privatisation of the NHS so we have an NHS service that is fit for those who need it. We need to establish the fully funded national care service. We heard from the speaker on the video about the problems she faced on 24-hour shift and the complex needs of individuals. And we need a system that addresses that. And more importantly, we need sustainable public housing. We need to end the shame of homelessness in this country. And it should be all, and we mean all, our responsibility to end in work poverty law. What we've got through Boris Johnson and his rhetoric is a government who talks about levelling up, but are not going to do it. As Max Walker said earlier, instead of levelling up, we see a raid on pay and pensions. And we've got an opposition who, well, who knows? Who knows what the opposition position is on these issues. Nothing gets said. And we won't see anything meaningful tomorrow, I don't think, from the leader of the opposition on that. So when Francis talks about unions being ignored, that's why, following on from the motion yesterday about a new deal for workers, we believe it is us, the trade union movement. We need to put in place our agenda and our policies before the end of 2021. We need to take that message to our community. We need to engage with them about why these four key areas impact. They impact upon our members, they impact upon our members' families, and they impact upon the communities that our members live and work within. We need to build a new movement, and it's time to engage with the many to shift the balance of forces and power in society away from the few. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Tony. Um, our next speaker is Fran Heathcote from PCS. Fran, you're very welcome. 
Thanks so much, Gail. Fran Heathcote, PCS, to fully support Composite One, but I want to spend the time I've got focusing on our DVLA dispute, all about COVID and the government and the employer's total failure to protect staff. And I want to start by saying thanks. Our three and a half thousand members from DVLA Swansea asked me to make clear how grateful they are for the support that you comrades have given them. Messages of support from across the UK and the movement, donations of over £47,000. These gestures make all the difference and it's this kind of support that shows our movement at its best. There have been so many positives, over 500 new members, more women, not just active but leading that campaign. Active because it's the union who tr they trust for their safety, not the employer. Congress won't need reminding why there's been a strike at DVLA. There have now been over 788 COVID cases. Sadly, one worker died, undoubtedly he caught COVID at work, a workplace he should never have been forced into. And the response from the employer, a total and willingness to do what other civil service departments have done, act fast and get more staff working from home. DWP and HMRC staff work from home, paying both benefit and furlough payments. But the DVLA, you need to go in because your driving licence is more sensitive than your personal financial and medical records. I don't think so. But this was the astonishing claim repeatedly argued by the DVLA, including to the Transport Select Committee. Even when DVLA commissioned a Deloitte study offering ways that the work could be done off-site, the CEO, Julie Leonard, refused to implement it, using every trick to avoid sharing the details with PCS or with, their MP, or with MPs. Her performance at not just one but two select committees has been woeful. Even the Conservative chair of the committee accused her of misleading the committee, in other words, lying. The same Hugh Merriman openly told the Transport Minister that the industrial action at the DVLA was on ministry. They had intervened to stop an agreement being reached to end the strike, not just once, but twice. And why have they objected? Because they don't want to reward industrial action. And what about Grant Shapps? He continues to refuse to meet us, berates the strike action and berates the strikers. This week in Parliament, he described the strike as pointless. Of course it's pointless to him. He doesn't have to go into a workplace fearing COVID, getting ill, long-term complications, or in one case, paying the ultimate price. It isn't pointless to our members up there who actually believe it's only striking that's kept them safe. It isn't pointless to the staff who fear another terrifying autumn of rising cases. Cases have risen by over 100 since mid-August. It's not pointless for them to keep fighting against a repeat of the mismanagement and mishandling of COVID, to speak out against an employer hell-bent on sleepwalking into another disaster. DVLA is an example of where the employer is getting it wrong and the union is getting it right. It is no surprise that despite all those weeks applauding key workers on doorsteps whilst the cameras rolled, the government is failing to do right by its own employees, failing to protect their health and safety at work, the most basic right that we are owed. Our members deserve better and with your support, Congress, we are well on our way to delivering that. In passing this motion, you are sending a message to the government that their actions and inactions are unacceptable. Stand with PCS members at the DVLA, defend the right to a safe work workplace for all, solidarity and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Fran. Um, we'll move on to the next speaker, Andreen Bamford from EIS. Andreen, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, Andreen Bamford from EIS, speaking in support of Composite One. All areas of society have been adversely affected by the pandemic. In particular, it has severely disrupted the education of children and young people and negatively affected their well-being. In Scotland, we are still seeing high numbers of school absences due to positive cases and self-isolating students and staff. And we realise that education recovery is not going to be fixed by a plan that simply looks to getting us back to the norm of where we were before. We need a progressive education recovery plan which is fully funded. It needs to be bold, ambitious and well researched to address and resolve the effect of societal inequities on children and young people's education as revealed and exacerbated by the pandemic. We ask the General Council to campaign for the UK and devolved devol administration governments to significantly increase funding to schools in order to, number one, reduce class sizes and increase the individual teacher attention for children and young people. As practitioners, we know that this is without a doubt the most effective way of raising attainment and creating a classroom environment which gives the best platform for positive learning experiences 
to fully utilise supply teachers and reduce the amount of teachers in effect of zero hours contracts. We need more teachers in schools and we need them to have contractual stability, not precarious work. Three, we need to increase specialist additional support needs or special educational needs support to provide the targeted support where it's needed most. Over the years, we've seen cuts to these services and uh, specialist provisions and following the pandemic, a return to the norm is nowhere near enough. We need more funding to address the, the slowing of the progress of pupils with additional support needs. Four, we need to implement a national men mentorship programme for young people who have been disproportionately disadvantaged by COVID-19 disruption. This campaign should also include the educational needs of young people in further and higher education. And we also ask the General Council to continue to campaign for safe working conditions in all public workspaces with a full range of mitigations that meet and exceed government guidance and regulations, including and especially better ventilation in all public buildings. The risk faced by public health workers is still significant, even with two doses of the vaccine. The worry over long COVID is still live and growing, and the anxieties facing public workplaces are still high. Therefore, we need additional resources to ensure the health of public workers is properly and fairly cared for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrine. Uh, our next speaker is Jill Taylor from CSP. Jill, you're welcome. President, Congress, Jill Taylor from the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy. Since we last met in person, we've seen our world change beyond all recognition. My union, the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, has witnessed the enormous impact that COVID has had on our patients, on the NHS, on our economy, and on society across the world. I know we are not alone. All of our unions represent members whose health, workplaces, livelihoods and families' lives have been changed forever. Many of our COVID patients were exposed to the disease at work. Workers were left to pay the human cost of the actions, or rather inactions, of employers putting profits before health protections. Recognising COVID and long COVID as industrial diseases would strengthen the hand of those workers in obtaining recognition and compensation, alleviating in some small way the financial as well as the health hardships they've experienced. In addition to financial support and justice, survivors need high quality care to aid their physical and psychological recovery. Rehabilitation enables people to achieve their potential and provides support to us all as we, so that we can live as well as possible. It's vital for those people recovering from COVID and those whose care and treatment has been interrupted by lockdown after lockdown. The CSP believes a comprehensive strategic approach to meeting the rehabilitation needs is required as we work to help the recovery from the pandemic. Health service leaders and policy makers need to be taking urgent action to ensure this is delivered. Rehabilitation services are always complex. For COVID patients, they are even more so. The one in 10 people who experience long COVID after infection report a multitude of symptoms. And these multiple symptoms need a complex range of services to be involved in the care of these patients. But currently, rehabilitation provision remains patchy. The system is neither comprehensive or universal. The well-off may turn to private provision, the majority can't, and far too many go without entirely. Lives are disrupted, relatives and loved ones left helpless and frustrated, and patients end up re-entering the most expensive parts of our health service. All this runs counter to the founding principles of the NHS based on need and not on the ability to pay. This in turn fuels health inequalities. It worsens the fact that the pandemic disproportionately affected those already living with disabilities, those living in areas of high deprivation, those from minority ethnic communities and other oppressed groups. Congress, by supporting this motion, we will add our voice to those of over 50 trade unions, professional bodies and patient groups who have come together to ensure there is equal access to high quality community rehabilitation services for all. Please support the composite motion. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, next up is Jackie Marshall from the POA. You're welcome, Jackie. President, Congress, Jackie Marshall, POA, speaking in support of the composite. Congress, what a fantastic job our key workers did throughout the heart of the pandemic. Working 
to ensure the public was safe, to ensure key workers' children were looked after, to ensure we could buy food to put on the table, to ensure our mail was delivered, to ensure our ill were cared for, to ensure our bins were emptied, and many, many more roles. This was all done by workers who couldn't stay at home, couldn't keep themselves safe, they had to go to work, which increased their chances of catching the virus. Obviously, I can talk about prison officers, looking after people who were, who were ill, something they're not trained to do. Trying to keep people apart, which en masse is something they don't do. Some were living in caravans and camper vans on prison car parks. Some were staying at centre parks who offered free accommodation. At least one was living in a tent on his back lawn. Like many other workers, they were scared and scared for their families. However hard people in the UK tried to keep themselves and their families safe, people died. Over 150,000 people in the UK have COVID-19 on their death certificate. Congress, we've lived through something none of us have ever lived through before, and I'm sure none of us ever want to live through again. We need to honour each and every life that has been lost during the pandemic and acknowledge every worker's effort to keep the country running. We ask Congress to call on the government to assign a national day to remember those who lost their life and the sacrifices of all workers. Please support. Thank you very much indeed, Jackie. Um, our next speaker is Kate Fallon from the AEP. Kate, you're welcome. Thank you. President, Congress, Kate Fallon, General Secretary of the Association of Educational Psychologists, pleased to be supporting Composite One. The pandemic has had a huge impact on our children and young people. It has made worse problems that already existed, reduced and underfunded services, rising child poverty, reduced early help and intervention, and an education system that is not meeting the needs of all children, a curriculum that's too narrow, and many children being marginalised by restrictive policies and exclusions. We agreed with the government's recovery czar, Sir Kevin Collins, when he said the pandemic revealed underlying scars and issues in the system. We see these scars and issues, their effects and impact on children and young people, and were dismayed by the resignation of Kevin Collins as a result of the government's refusal to implement the recommendations to his important report. We're concerned that some politicians see recovery as a short-term project, a quick fix, when what is needed is more fundamental change. Our goal cannot be to return things to how they were before. We ask Congress to endorse the National Children's Bureau campaign, Children at the Heart, calling on the government to produce a recovery and rebuild plan designed to enable our children to thrive. It's time for a rethink and a reset in our education system. To see a root and branch review of the narrow academic curriculum prescribed for our children and young people. We need a new curriculum that supports all educational settings to provide an inclusive learning environment for all children and young people with a focus on learning a wide range of skills that will enable them all to leave education happy, healthy, and well-equipped to enter adulthood. A curriculum fit for today's children and young people that values creative and vocational opportunities equally alongside academic outcomes. We need investment in education, an ambitious plan for all services, including funding and support or joined up early help and intervention when required. The pandemic has had an unprecedented impact on our children. The unprecedented times we're in demand an unprecedented response, unprecedented in the scale of our ambitions and in the strength of our commitment to the well-being of all children and young people. Congress, please support. Thank you, Kate. Um, our next speaker is Daniel um, Kabede uh, from the NENU. Daniel. 
Thank you, President uh, Congress. Uh, Daniel Kebedi, National Education Union. Congress, uh, first and foremost, I am a teacher, and during this pandemic, I have witnessed a collective of educators go the extra mile in every sense. Our schools never closed. They were always open for the most vulnerable and key worker children. Educators developed new skills overnight, delivering the ability to educate remotely and did their utmost to maintain continuity of, it, maintain continuity of education during a time of crisis. At each stage of this pandemic, we cried out for the resources that would have made face-to-face -face education more possible. For the Nightingale schools, the mass testing for the smaller class sizes, the mobilisation of more staff, and begged for what was needed for continuity of education when virus levels got too high, the rollout of fast broadband, laptops and technology for those in poverty. Our profession cares about the health and safety of our children, our colleagues and communities deeply. And that is why the NEU saw the largest trade union meetings in history. But at each stage, this government has failed. And it is because of this government's failure, our children had one of the highest rates of lost school days in the world. And it's not just school time that our children lost. They lost time to collaborate, to imagine, to create and to play. Colleagues, nation's children have been long forgotten in the policy-making decisions of this government. A child returning to school this September, beginning in year nine, about to pick their GCSEs, was born in the wake of the financial crisis. They have never known a life that wasn't impacted by cuts and austerity. This generation who didn't have, this is the generation who didn't have Sure Start, who had their early intervention funding wiped, who had their school budgets raided, and who were already seeing child poverty rates rapidly rise. Nine in a class of every 30, with over a million children living in overcrowded housing, all prior to the pandemic. This generation of children were forced to pay for the crisis of 2009 and have suffered because of it. And we must not let that happen again. Again, we must be clear that enough is enough. Our children are not responsible for this government's failure to act on COVID-19. They are not responsible for the, the uh, uh, government who ignored scientific advice over lockdowns and circuit breaks, which as a result led to the biggest economic slump in, in 300 years. Our children need 15 billion investment in their education recovery as a starting point. And to set that into context, that is less than half of the 37 billion given to Dido Harding for Test and Trace. But the reality is we are far from it, so far from it, that Sir Kevin Collins, uh, the COVID recovery czar, found his position untenable. We are seeing only £310 being spent on uh, per child being spent on COVID recovery in the UK, compared to 1800 in the USA and 2000 2100 in the Netherlands. Congress austerity did not work then and it will not work now. Our children need a better deal. We need the ambition from government that we saw after World War II when debt was 270% of GDP and yet we saw the creation of a welfare state, the development of an NHS, investment in quality homes and comprehensive education for all. This is the ambition we need. Congress, it is time. We brought an end to this government government's ideological war on work people and it a war in which our children are the collateral damage thank you thank you very much indeed Danny um, for that great contribution next up is Jane Jones from Usdall Jane you're very welcome thank you president congress Jane Jones Usdall supporting the composite on recover and rebuild congress I am proud to be a key worker in the retail sector and I am proud to represent retail and distribution workers as All Stores president. Retail workers have had an 18 months like no other, working so hard to keep the nation fed. The pandemic has shown just how severe the challenges are for so many working people across the country. The crisis has demonstrated a UK labour market defined by low pay, insecure work and in-work poverty, where employment practices such as zero hours and short hours contracts are damaging mental health and well-being. Union reps are working hard to address these deep-rooted inequalities, which were holding back many working people long before the virus. And more than ever in this last 18 months, unions have supported key workers on the front line, making sure safety measures are put in place and followed, supporting vulnerable workers, pregnant women, and all those who are struggling to cope with the stresses and strains working through a pandemic. Protecting our members in the workplace is not just about keeping them physically safe, 
it's about supporting their mental health too. Sadly, retail workers, like many other key and essential workers, have been underpaid and undervalued for far too long. They have faced an appalling increase in abuse during the pandemic, and all of this has an ongoing impact on their mental health and well-being. In the public sector or the private sector, it is not acceptable that workers are left worrying about insecure work and poverty pay. It is not acceptable that workers across many key sectors are facing abuse on a daily basis or trying to do their jobs and keep the public safe. Congress, it is clear that we urgently need an economic plan that delivers real changes for working people. A plan that invests in our vital public services, including the mental health support that is so desperately needed. We need a plan for decent pay and secure work with good terms and conditions, including decent sick pay so people can take time off work when ill. A plan that gives all working people the respect and dignity they rightly deserve. Please, please support the Composite. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, we move now to Suzanne Tyler from the RCM. Suzanne, you're welcome. Thank you, President. It's always a huge privilege to speak for the UK's midwives at Congress. Suzanne Tyler of the Royal College of Midwives speaking in support of this composite. Public sector's workers were at the forefront during COVID, often without adequate PPE, short-staffed, overworked and vulnerable. Through it all, our members, and excuse the pun, kept delivering. But public services cannot be built on goodwill alone, and the chickens have come home to roost. And what we see now is a new pandemic of burnout, low morale, PTSD, fatigue and exhaustion. Research by the University of Roehampton found that shortly after the peak of COVID, over 21% of healthcare workers were reporting high levels of depression compared with 5% before. That's a rise of more than 300%. And similarly, levels of anxiety and severe stress more than quadrupled. Healthcare workers from ethnic minority backgrounds had a 50% greater chance of experiencing PTSD symptoms and were significantly more worried about lack of PPE, about losing their jobs and of becoming ill. Other research has shown that midwives and nurses are at particular risk of work-related stress and burnout due to the lack of support that they have in work, their poor terms and conditions, their challenging work-life balance, and the demands of providing compassionate care. Many of those who can are now opting for early retirement. And we're seeing students who don't want to work as a midwife when they qualify. And the, the bedrock of the NHS, the bank shift system, is crumbling because people won't work extra shifts. Sickness and absenteeism rates have never been higher. The answer is to properly invest in our staff. Yes to adequate staffing levels and yes to pay that reflects their contribution but also a workplace that puts staff well-being at the forefront, that gives access to mental and psychological support services. Our members need time and support to rest and recover and regroup. That means employers really listening and acting on what makes a workplace as compassionate and rewarding as the care our members give. Please support this motion and campaign for staff well-being and recovery, including access for frontline staff to mental health and psychological well-being services. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. Um, the next speaker is the last speaker um, in this debate, Stevie McGregor from Community. Stevie, you're very welcome. Thank you, Mr. President. Congress, Stevie McGregor, Community Union, supporting Composite 1 with a focus on COVID and education recovery. Early years education is a critical part of children's lives. Studies have shown again and again that those early years of learning are what begins to shape them for life. We know that this is the early years that gaps between the haves and the not haves begin to emerge in earnest. Our youngest people have most of a year and a half of critical learning that they missed out on. Young children have particularly lost skills, social skills, with the most worst effects and the most disadvantaged. 
community's recent report, The Future of Education, showed us that 78% of teachers believe that online learning increased the gaps between the advantaged and the disadvantaged learners. Only 38% of staff had been given the appropriate training to prepare them for online learning, and one in three were without the necessary equipment they needed to deliver online learning. As these young children arrive in secondary school, with their development already at massively different levels, these gaps will be incredibly hard to close and will place even larger burden on our wider education system. Yet Congress, our early years education system, stands on the precipice of collapse. 22.39% of education and early years staff indicated that they plan to leave within the next three years. The primary reasons given for leaving the sector were the pressures that accompanied the role, high administrative workload and low pay. As we speak, speak to re, seek sorry, to rebuild a better working world post-pandemic, we must ensure high quality early year provisions is available to all children to support them to have a good start in life. We must do this as in 10, 15, 20 years time, we don't want to look the young people in the eye and say, we didn't do what we could. Congress, please support. Thank you very much, Stevie. I think you'll find that I'm the uh, Mus President as opposed to the Mr. President. <laughs> Thank you for your contribution. Um, and thanks to all of our inspiring speakers. It was just so good um, to hear your voices from our front lines. So many thanks. Um, I'm going to now call motion eight, the economic impact of COVID-19, defending disabled workers' rights in current and post-COVID-19 periods. The General Council support the motion. The motion will be moved by Dave Allen on behalf of the TUC Disabled Workers Conference and then seconded by Colleen Johnson from the, the NEU. So, Dave, uh, on behalf of the TUC Disabled Workers Conference, I call you to move Motion 8. You're very welcome. Um, Dave, you're on mute, um, so if you could sort that out, please. The, to um, unmute me, um, and, I, and I don't know where that uh, unmute button is. Dave, you are now unmuted, so even if by accident you found that button, well done, brother, um, you're very welcome. Right. Thank you, President. Good morning, Congress. Dave Allen, co-chair of the TUC Disabled Workers Committee and chair of Unite the Union Disabled Members Committee, moving Motion 8 on the effect of COVID-19 and long COVID on disabled workers. Over the period of COVID, society has changed out of all recognition. We have lost many friends, colleagues and family members. Hundreds of thousands more have had their lives changed forever by the effects of long COVID. Across the UK, six in 10 of all deaths involving COVID-19 were disabled people. There have now been over 135,000 people have lost their lives. That means over 81,000 disabled people have died. Many disabled workers have had their impairments worsened and many more non-disabled workers have become disabled by the effects of long COVID. There is a lot of work for our movement to do to ensure disabled workers are treated fairly and the barriers put in our way are removed. TUC evidence found in November 2020 that the disability pay gap, gap had increased. In November, disabled workers earned on average 20% less than their non-disabled peers. This was the equivalent of £3,800 a year, an increase of £800 a year compared with the 2009 findings. And recently, the Office of National Statistics released new figures that redundancy rates are 62% higher for disabled workers. The UK is in an economic crisis and a recession, and like the last time, 
disabled workers are the first to lose their jobs and the last to be rehired. And they are experiencing negative changes to their in-work terms and conditions. The pandemic has brought to the foreground many of the issues disabled workers and disabled people are facing. We have seen disabled workers step up and support our employers in less than ideal circumstances. We have continued to work from home, something we told for many years was not possible without the reasonable adjustments we needed. However, it is now more than a year since the first lockdown and many disabled workers are still working from home without the adjustments we need. We know that a year on, some disabled workers are still working off ironing boards or without the specialist software they require. This is not acceptable. Workplace protections under the Equality Act have not changed under the pandemic. Employers need to meet their legal duties and put in place the adjustments workers need to do their job. Our members should not dread going into work because they believe they are being set up to fail. And earlier I mentioned working from home, which is for many a reasonable adjustment, and for many it is the reasonable adjustment they were told was not possible. Yet the pandemic has shown that for many working from home has not only been possible, but a reality. We have seen a home working revolution for disabled people, and this must not fade away when the pandemic is passed. And not all disabled workers forced to work from home have, had, have benefited from it. Some have said the isolation has had a negative effect on their mental health. However, other disabled workers who have worked from home have told us that as a result, they were able to do their jobs better with less pain, less fatigue, and allow them the ability to better manage their time, health condition, or impairment. We in our movement must continue to ensure employers put in place and keep in place members' reasonable adjustments, including home working. And going forward, we must ensure home working is at the workers' request, not the employers' demand. And finally, let me end on this note. It is important we do not forget the social model of disability, a model the TUC and your Disabled Workers Committee remain committed to. Disabled people must be seen as equal citizens with the same rights as everyone else. We must not forget that the Tory government were found by the United Nations of creating a human catastrophe and that there was evidence of grave and systematic violations of the rights of people with disabilities. We don't beg, we don't plead, we are not seeking charity, nor what we are doing is demanding our rights, our rights as full and equal citizens. The social model recognizes this and sees us. It will help us remove the barriers which stop our full participation in society. We know we must carry on fighting. We know we must strengthen our links with deaf and disabled people's organizations like DPAC and RUFA who are fighting back. We must and we will. As trade unionists, we were brought up in a spirit of unity. Solidarity, support Motion 8. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dave. And indulge me, Congress. On the platform, we were saying that was one of those contributions where we wish there was a round of applause. And thank you, Dave, for your leadership of the Disabled Workers Committee and for that contribution. If I can call uh, Colleen Johnson, please, from NEU to second the motion. Colleen, you're very welcome. Colleen Johnson, TUC Disabled Workers Committee. President, conference, there is no doubt that disabled workers have been at the sharp end of this pandemic. If it wasn't at, at higher risk workers, deeply anxious about their fundamental health and well-being, it was others who discovered their reasonable adjustments were affected by the COVID safety measures. Most recently, disabled workers have found themselves disproportionately selected for redundancy during restructuring processes and this has caused very real hardship and distress. Whilst Freedom Day was no freedom at all for those who were previously shielding and found all support and measures were gone. This motion requests working from home whenever possible, but this should not be done on the cheap. The necessary equipment should be provided and that should include integration into meetings. For example, to avoid the very real issue of social isolation. I want to move on now to some of the more positive things that have happened recently that we need to build on. Access to meetings via Zoom and other platforms has great, greatly benefited 
benefited disabled workers who might have struggled to attend every physical meeting. There has been a greater collectivisation of issues as more people recognised the challenges faced by disabled workers in the workplace. And of course, more people have joined trade unions throughout the pandemic. The question is, how do we maintain and build on the positives? We need to give disabled workers the confidence to self-identify. In the NEU, we have a fraction of the actual number of disabled members who identify as such openly to their trade union. We need to let disabled workers know that they are not alone and atomised, but that they have the collective voice of their colleagues behind them. Our rallying cry should be for the union movement as a whole to recognise and prioritise issues affecting disabled members. There needs to be organising and action to protect jobs and well-being, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic, where long COVID, for example, could mean many more workers become disabled. Conference, please support this important motion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Colleen. Um, so thank, thanks to, to Dave and to Colleen and all speakers uh, in that debate. As there's no opposition, the General Council uh, Statement Composite Motion, General Council Statement Composite Motion One and Motion Eight are all carried. Um, Congress, that brings us to the end of this morning's session. Um, thanks again to all our speakers. May I remind colleagues that there are online fringes you can attend, and please do take a look at our online exhibition. All the details can be found on the TUC website. So, Congress is now adjourned until 2pm. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you after that break. Goodbye.